Good evening, everybody. My name is Gus Mitchell. Uh, some of you may already know me, but those of you that don't, I'm a beekeeper in the Memphis metro area. You can see my honey house here. It is uh, located right outside of West Memphis here in Arkansas in Crittenden County. Um, I've been keeping bees for quite a while now. Uh, I moved to Memphis in 2015. And that's when I started uh, messing with Russian bees. Um, as Christy mentioned, it's predominantly uh, Russian bee area there. We had uh, Ronnie Clift, uh, Dina Hodges, Billy Joe Adair. The Coys uh, extended on down that way as well. Uh, lots of larger operations running Russian bees, so it kind of filtered over. Uh, Mr. Harry Fulton also sells bees to the Memphis Club. so. Uh, nearly all of the uh, the nukes that come into the Memphis area are Russian bees. So I fell into that. I enjoy Russian bees. I think they're great. So I, I am now a recent member of the Russian Breeders Association. So that's where I've started there. At my honey house, I have a, a small outdoor classroom. It's screened in. I do beekeeping tours. Uh, as well as classes. The tours are for the general public that may be afraid of bees. So you may notice it's a screened in room. Uh, there are gloves on the outside wall so that I can conduct an inspection and hand them the frames and they're able to actually handle bees and frames and look and observe but feel safe. Um, I enjoy that. Yes, ma'am, those are gloves. There's some on the other wall as well. Uh, I keep uh, just a few colonies there right at the honey house so that they don't become a pest, but uh, just for educational purposes. I really enjoy uh, teaching beekeeping to beekeepers, but I, I have a passion for introducing the general public to them as well and letting them see that, you know, they're nothing to be scared of, that they're amazing uh, and interesting creatures. Uh, in addition to honey cells, I sell nukes and queens. Uh, a lot more nukes than queens. I'm still working that part out. As you can see, uh, I raise my own queens. That's the purpose of all these painted uh, nuke boxes for orientation flights and, and hoping that uh, they make it back to the right hole. This man here, uh, if you're familiar at all with uh, Memphis area beekeepers, is Robert Hodum. Robert Hodum is 83 years old. Uh, he's a retired commercial beekeeper and now a retired honey packer. Uh, he still gets out and helps me. Um, and he has been the most influential person in my beekeeping uh, so far. And he's helped innumerable uh, amount of people, people start beekeeping. Uh, he's started a lot of uh, sideliners and commercial beekeepers as well. So he is uh, pretty well known in our area. Uh, this is him this spring, uh, putting queen cells in nukes with me. Like I said, uh, for 83 years old, he, he can get around really well. And this is here in uh, Arkansas. So, Christy asked me to speak about some beekeeping differences that I've noticed uh, from the Memphis area to uh, the Tennessee side to East Arkansas. To talk about that, we really have to talk about nectar sources because that's what makes the most difference. Um, a lot of the floral sources are the same, predominantly the same. The primary difference is within the soil. Uh, Memphis sits on a bluff. I'm sure some of you have heard it called the Bluff City. It sits up on a bluff. Um, down around it are the uh, alluvial soils of the Delta here. You run into those again uh, coming into Millington right outside of Memphis and that extends all the way on up toward Dyersburg which is uh, also a very good spot for commercial beekeeping. We get thousands of colonies uh, brought into there into West Tennessee from there. On the other side of the river in Arkansas from West Memphis all the way up through Jonesboro and on it's the same kind of soil. It's excellent for uh, honey production. It does really well, and that's what draws commercial beekeepers to it. Uh, that same soil is also uh, 
in North Mississippi around Tunica. Uh, opposite side of, of Horseshoe Lake down there is Tunica, Mississippi. And a lot of commercial beekeepers will extend from uh, all the way up the Delta to about that point, from the Coldwater River all the way down through there. The kind of places that I look for here in Arkansas for bee yards, um, we have a lot of row crop, a lot of agriculture here. It can be intimidating and scary uh, to have your bees near soybean and cotton because of pesticide issues and sprays. Uh, but you can mitigate that by choosing good apiary sites. You may notice that this yard uh, and all of my yards, you're gonna find a very good windbreak. That windbreak is critical when you're gonna be around row crops because it's gonna help dissipate a lot of that spray. Uh, also, I look for wetland areas. Wetland areas are important because farmers are trying to make a living just like, well, if you're a commercial beekeeper, just like you would be. Um, they don't spray willy-nilly. They spray when they have to because those chemicals are very expensive. Diesel is very expensive. So they spray when they need to. Um, most all your farmers are gonna have areas uh, or places and acres of land that they can't tend to, that they can't do anything with because they're wetlands. Though it, it might be a bit of an inconvenience sometimes getting into them, those are the safest place for your bees uh, because they're not going to be spraying those. So you also, you get the natural windbreak, you get early pollen and nectar sources, and you have the benefit of water as well. So uh, we have a lot of that in the upper delta here, a uh, lot of sloughs, uh, places along the bayous and the rivers um, that are excellent places that, that you can be protected from the row crop. Here's another yard you can see right off of some sunflowers just, just to illustrate some of my yard choices. Now let's get into nectar sources. One of our earliest and most significant nectar sources is the red maple. These are red maple buds beginning to pop. Whether you're uh, in Jonesboro or Memphis, this is gonna be your first real significant source of nectar for your bees. And this is gonna ramp them up and initiate that, that spring buildup. This is the red maple blossom open. Tree blossoms are funny in that most people ignore them. They don't, they don't notice them. They're, they don't tend to be as showy. Red maple is an exception. It's very bright colored and beautiful, but most of these are, are very green and muted, and uh, you wouldn't notice them unless you were looking for them or happened to hear the bees buzzing. But this is red maple, and it's uh, definitely a very important nectar source. I recommend that everyone go out and find the closest red maples to their bee yards and take note of them. Use them as an indicator tree because if you watch these trees closely and you watch for these blooms, you're going to be able to predict when your bees start building up in the spring and you can start your management from there. Dandelions. Dandelions are a significant nectar source, uh, a great pollen source. And in Crittenden County, which I'm sure um, it wouldn't be very much different for y'all, we start getting these in December. So they are early, but they're not quite as significant as the red maples, which tend to start toward the end of February. But these are very important. Uh, they're a good reason not to cut your grass very early in the year. Uh, the bees, they don't have a whole lot of, of stuff going on, and, and these tie them over to those maples. I'm sure everybody knows this flower, but uh, there's uh, some controversy around this flower. Uh, there's purple, dead nettle, and there's henbit. And people like to argue about that, but it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, they are different, but they're very much the same. They do the same for the bees. They bloom at the same time. Uh, they give off red pollen, and you can tell that the bees have been working these, they'll have a war stripe. They'll have a little orange reddish stripe right down their head because uh, the narrowness of these blossoms. So that's a telltale sign. Now these also are some of the earliest blooming. 
and they kind of sustain the bees, at least uh, in my area. They, they sustain them through the hard times because we have very mild winters. We don't have real winter. We'll have 50, 60 degree days throughout the winter at certain points. So these bees are out flying and they're out foraging and they're looking for things and this is what they find. Uh, I have noticed these blooming again starting as early as November. Definitely December, January, February, March, they're right on through. Uh, the unfortunate part of this is that you may see beautiful fields of henbit or dead nettle, just absolutely acres of it, uh, but they, they tend to get sprayed in the agriculture areas. Um, in your yards, you may have thick patches of them and they do a lot of good for a lot of insects. So I would like to have more education and talks with farmers about the benefit of leaving uh, that vegetable matter in their soil, tilling it in. Uh, I think there could be some benefits there as well. I know there are some cons for them like uh, moisture retention in their fields. They need to get in there early and they don't need it holding down all that soil, you know. Uh, but there's ways to, to discuss things and, and work things out. And that's uh, an important part of extension work and, and lobbying that these universities do for us. You notice this red pollen. You may also notice a very faint red stripe on the bee to the left. That is henbit pollen or purple dead nettle. Um, some old timers get it confused and think that this is red maple. Red maple does not have red pollen. It's more of a grayish pollen. Uh, one of the few things, especially this early, that will make red pollen will be the purple dead nettle or the henbit. And uh, as you can see, it's very vibrant. It stands out in the comb significantly. It's important to pay attention to pollen colors. When you look at pollen and you look at the pollen baskets on your bees, they tell you a story if, you, if you're willing to read it. Uh, Beekeeping can be as complicated or as simple as you want to make it. I, I choose to make it very complicated because I enjoy it. Um, but getting out and walking around and learning your, your, your floral sources is extremely important. And one way to do that is by watching your bees. And they're going to show you and they're going to tell you what they're working. You may not have the plant knowledge to identify right away what they're working. But with today's technology, it's very easy to snap a picture. Uh, and, and look at it and learn later what your bees are working. Learn those floral sources and pay attention to them. Because these are what dictate how your bees build up, what they're going to be doing, when they're going to swarm, all of these things. So pollen tells a lot. You may notice a little blue pollen, purple pollen, dark brown pollen. A lot of dark brown pollen in there. Does anybody know what that is? It's white clover makes almost a black, dark brown pollen. Uh, this is an extremely significant nectar source for us uh, throughout this region and Lord, uh, across a lot of the United States. This is black locust. And this is gonna be your first real honey crop. Uh, they are a delicate blossom. They get beat off the trees very easily with rain but they, uh, they don't get washed out quite as bad as tulip poplar because they are a downward facing blossom. They're very uh, vigorous, they're a native tree, uh, very prolific, grow everywhere, and they produce an abundance of very light colored honey, very floral, fragrant, high quality honey, when you can get it. Uh, I personally planted uh, 50 of these year before last. I got them from the uh, Arkansas Forestry Department. You can get them, I think they're roughly somewhere between 25 to 50 cents a piece and lots of 50. So you can go in together and get bare root and uh, plant them. Like I said, these are native trees. They're nitrogen fixers. They're great for your soil. They're, they're great for a lot of things and uh, they make a really good crop of honey. We have that uh, on both sides of the river, uh, especially in Memphis around the city. There's lots of these. Do y'all notice many around Jonesboro? I figured you would. Uh, they're, they're significant 
across most of the eastern United States. I have a question. I know around here, during this season, when they bloom, mm -hmm. they have a very heavy rainfall. Mm -hmm. I don't recall if we noticed a drop in the flow. Mm -hmm. but I'm curious, did you happen to notice? Mm -hmm. They're very delicate. If they have a good canopy, typically you're going to find these in the margins. Yeah. You're not going to find them deep in the forest. You're, you're going to. Yes. Yeah. How you have the 24, sometimes 36 hours after rain, and then you have the 24 hours after rain, and the next year comes back. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed, you said that this is better than tulip as far as all that? The reason that it's better than tulip poplar is because it is a more closed blossom, it hangs down in a group, in a cluster. Uh, I'm going to show you a tulip poplar blossom here in just a second, but it's a more protect, protected blossom. We get a lot of rain. Sometimes they're not heavy rains. They're just very light rains. So like this past spring, did you notice? This past spring, I, I found this past spring to be uh, really hard. I felt like we had uh, a late spring. Things were much cooler. Be because of the the cooler temperatures now it wasn't cold like you would think ooh I'm cold but it was cool enough because plants need nectar I mean heat to secrete nectar um, and because of the the coolness of this spring a lot of plants were, were just not putting out and to me build up was much later and it did affect me Uh, I would say black locusts would take a lot more rain than tulip poplars just because it's a more protective bus. Black locust is, is more reliable than tulip poplar, but as I said, it is a very delicate blossom and it, with hard rains, it will get beat off the tree. Once that happens, it does not, it may bloom more, but those blossoms are gone. Um, it is such a prolific nectar source that you can smell these in the wind. They. If you're near a grove of black locusts, you'll just get these wafts of perfume. They just secrete so much nectar. Uh, you can even taste it out of the flowers. Yes, ma'am? Is it a vine? No, ma'am, it is a tree. It is a thorny tree. It is very popular as a fence post. Uh, it doesn't grow to be very large, but uh, it's very dense, uh, rot-resistant wood. It's a Tough tree, very thorny. It is not uh, to be mistaken with the honey locust. Bees do not work the honey locust, and honey locust does not secrete nectar. It's good for cattle. They eat the pods. But. Uh, this is holly. Around Memphis, Memphis is an old city, an old um, suburb area. You can find vast hedgerows of holly that are so thick and so abundant that you can make a crop of honey off of these. Uh, I'm sure some of you that have kept bees for uh, a number of years have gotten these calls in the spring. I got a swarm in my holly bush. I got a swarm in my holly bush. They call and pester you to death. Um, that it is not a swarm. They are just hungry and happy for it. And they just absolutely cover these holly bushes up. Um, you can make a very unique interesting honey off of this if you have a good hedgerow like uh, there's a old church uh, not too far from Memphis and they have probably a five acre lot and around the perimeter of three quarters of that are mature Nellie Stevens hollies and um, you could probably make two supers of honey in the spring off of them the thing is is you got to pull it off because there's a sort of a mini dearth in between that early spring point before you really start getting more nectar and they are in a uh, they have a lot of momentum building up at that point and they will consume it but holly is a great windbreak to plant uh, in addition to it being evergreen and an excellent wind year-round windbreak it produces tons of nectar and it's a it's a beautiful tree and it's great for wildlife because when the bees work these hollies, they are slam loaded down with berries. That's great for the birds. This is a tulip poplar blossom. As you can see, it's like a bowl, like magnolia. It is, uh, it's actually in the same family. It is straight up. 
these uh, these blossoms they get beat off the tree like nothing else down here um, and if there's any light rain they get washed out where I'm from in the mountains in Virginia this was our uh, most significant honey crop uh, we have much more forested areas than what is around here so you had understory and uh, lots of trees to protect the blossoms more Around here, uh, I mostly find them in along fence rows or in old neighborhoods as uh, shade trees and things. They're kind of standalone trees and they're much more susceptible to the rains. Um, I've been in the Memphis metro area and keeping bees in East Arkansas for about seven years and I have not found the tulip poplar to be a reliable source for a honey crop. Now. When it's good, it's good. And you're gonna get a couple few supers off of this. It's gonna be dark amber honey, um, almost a molassesy type flavor. It's very popular, uh, people like it, but it's just not a dependable nectar source around here in my experience. Yeah, it blooms in May. It's one of your early crops. It, it blooms uh, in certain years, it can be different of course, but uh, it can bloom around the time of black locust. Generally, black locust is a little bit earlier, but sometimes things set things back a little bit or move them forward, and every year is not exactly the same, so you just have to remember a range. Uh, if you're getting this at the same time that you're getting black locust, it will, in my opinion, um, hurt the quality of your, your locust honey because it's going to darken it significantly. Uh-huh. That's a different story, yeah. I imagine uh, the ridge uh, would be more similar to what I'm used to in the mountains there. So uh, you probably have much more forested areas and they'll be more protected from the rain and you may be able to depend on a crop better. Uh, down there in West Memphis, uh, most of the farmers, unfortunately, they wage war on trees. Uh, they don't like them. You'll find old ditch rows that have been there uh, forever the trees have been there forever there'll be trees big around as I am and next thing you know they're in there with the track co ripping them up uh, don't know why <laughs> but uh you won't you won't find many mature tulip poplars you find more scrubby stuff this is privet Chinese privet is an invasive I think that may be a little better I'm sure y'all have seen that it is um, it's everywhere in the Memphis area. A lot less in um, the West Memphis, Crittenden County area. Now, along the levee at the bottom of West Memphis, there's an old neighborhood, and I find quite a bit of this privet hedge, uh, but nothing to compare with it in Memphis. In Memphis uh, and much of West Tennessee, this is the most significant nectar source of the year. It's gonna produce the most honey you're going to get supers and supers of honey off of this stuff. Uh, the rain don't hurt it, the drought don't hurt it, the cold don't hurt it, nothing hurts this stuff, you can't get rid of it. It's invasive uh, and it produces and it spreads like wildfire, but the bees love it and it makes a pretty decent golden color honey, got a little bit of a bite to it, but uh, it's definitely our most significant source for honey in uh, the Memphis metro area. Do y'all notice much of that up here? Most places do. Yes, it's very. It's tough on allergies. It's terrible on allergies. Uh, it's a good selling point for your honey. Uh, but it's uh, very significant, and the bees just do excellent off of it. It it produces twice as much as you're going to get off of the black locust and the, the tulip poplars. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of this stuff around uh, there around the agricultural fields in Crittenden County. Um, I imagine because a lot of my farmers are clean farmers. By clean, I mean they, they keep their ditches spotless uh, and it just hadn't had a chance to take hold. If this stuff ever is allowed to have a chance to take hold, it will spread and you cannot stop it. Uh, it you can stick a stick in the ground and it's gonna grow a bush of it, so. Blackberries. Uh, blackberries are very significant 
in the Memphis area as well as there uh, in West Memphis. It, um, we have two types really. We have the, the dewberry type, the real low sprawling trellising type that you'll grow in the wetlands. And then around the city, you know, you have the taller, more upright, uh, sprawling kind. Bees work them the same. I can't tell any difference in them really. The only difference being the fruit. Uh, they, they make an abundance of pollen and nectar. They're great for the bees. Uh, and it's a pretty long flow that these things last because of the couple different varieties that we have in the area. As I mentioned, you'll have some that you'll find more in the upland areas, uh, and then you'll have the dewberry types uh, all along the wetlands, and, and they do real well. Clover is uh, pretty good, but it's not as significant as a lot of beekeepers think that it is. Um, it produces, and it produces well up to about June, but uh, most of these clovers do not tolerate the heat. And after it gets hot, they just don't put out. Up to that point though, they're pretty good. But I have a favorite myself and that's hairy vetch. I think hairy vetch is much better than clover if you're gonna be planting anything. Uh, around West Memphis, you'll find it just all over the ditches and a lot of fields and anywhere untended. It is, um, very, very good for the bees, and I find that it makes a honey identical to clover honey, just a little bit better. Kind of reminds me of alfalfa honey. Uh, there are places that you'll find they'll just be great swaths of this purple stuff. Uh, the great thing about vetch is that weeds don't hurt it. It's a weed itself. It'll kind of sprawl up and lay on top of them weeds, so it's great in ditches. It, it's great stuff, uh, and it, it produces quite a bit of nectar. I think uh, for me, and from what I've noticed, it's um, comparable to clover and probably a little better, and it tolerates the heat better. Now, this is one of the most significant uh, late spring, early summer nectar sources uh, in West Tennessee and East Arkansas, uh, particularly uh, in the... West Memphis area. This is sumac. There are three types of sumac that are going to make you supers and supers of honey. That's staghorn sumac, smooth sumac, and winged sumac. And they do not bloom at the same time. They are a staggered bloom. They start uh, generally roughly about the time that your soybean bloom starts in uh, June. So usually you can count on these to start around the first, second week of June and they keep putting out and keep putting out. Um, along the railroads, the ditches, anywhere birds fly, along the power lines, you're gonna notice these. Uh, they dry these red heads. You see them along the, the roadways, I'm sure. Make excellent smoker fuel. Uh, but they produce an astonishing amount of nectar. Uh, and in my opinion, this is some of the highest quality honey of anywhere. Uh, to me, it has a, a fruity taste similar to dried apples. Uh, it has a definite spicy note to it. Not as in heat, but like kind of like Christmas spices, nutmeg, cloves. It's, a, it's got a very good quality to it. Uh, if you do have soybeans going at the same time as this, then you're not going to get any of those notes like you would in, in a pure crop of it. It's just going to make your honey better, uh, maybe a little bit redder. And uh, it's abundant. It's all everywhere. I mean, acres and acres of it. If you was to put it all together, I'm sure it'd be thousands and thousands of acres of it. It's something you can count on. And like uh, I was speaking before, rain, water, nothing seems to hurt this stuff. It, what were the three types? It'd be staghorn, smooth, and winged. Now there are other types of sumac. Uh, I may not be familiar with all of them. There's a bunch of them. Uh, most of them you can look at and tell they'll be absolutely covered in bees and butterflies and native bees and all manner of, of beetles and any kind of insect you can think of. Um, so you'll know. 
can kind of see them there. It's a little hard. It's a very unimpressive bloom. It's a little green bloom like a lot of these things in the Delta. Uh, but bees love it. Soybeans. So if you um, look for your beekeeping information online in groups, uh, Facebook forums, things like that, you'll probably find that there's a lot of controversy surrounding the bloom color of soybeans and whether or not soybeans uh, produce honey. Here they do, uh, from this area all the way into North Mississippi, uh, West Tennessee, all this area produces a staggering amount of soybean honey. It's because of the soil. Soil is everything when it comes to soybeans producing nectar. Uh, and parts of Shelby County, uh, which is Memphis area there, you could be on 3,000 acres of soybeans and your bees would about starve to death. And then you could be on 300 acres of soybeans and make five supers of honey just across the river, maybe 10, 15 minutes away. Uh, and it, it has everything to do with the quality of the soil. As far as white blossoms compared to purple blossoms, I find no difference. Bees work them just the same. Uh, either way, they, they do well. Soybeans are a pretty reliable honey crop. Uh, in their self, they're not uh, an impressive honey. It's, it's good quality, but it's not wow award-winning honey. Uh, what makes soybean honey better is the little things that contribute, like the vines and the sumac. You can see it's a beautiful blossom. They look like little orchids. Soybeans, uh, soybeans require a lot of heat to produce nectar. You need it to not get under the 70s at night. You need it to stay warm, hot, and uh, unusually the, the hotter and drier it is, as long as it's an irrigated field, the better they're going to do. I mean, it could make the difference in a, a whole nother super of honey for you. Uh, as far as spraying goes, uh, soybeans do get sprayed uh, with a lot of herbicide, which is not going to bother your bees, but uh, they do occasionally get, get sprayed with pesticides that are going to harm your bees. The best thing that you can do is to have a relationship with the farmers around you or the farmers that you're on and ask them to be mindful, spray in the evenings and spray with ground rigs. Aerial spray is always going to hurt you. There's very little you can do to help your bees get away from aerial spraying. Ground rig spraying, really, uh, you, you'll have minimal damage, if any. This is pepper vine. Uh, pepper vine is all throughout this area. It's all throughout Memphis. It uh, is a significant nectar producer, and it's what makes the soybean honey uh, it's what makes the difference in somebody's soybean honey and another guy's that you're like, wow, this is really good honey. Uh, it imparts a lot more flavor to an otherwise uh, sweet, bland honey. The bees work it. It's a great pollen source. Uh, it's prolific. It spreads everywhere. It'll put on these dark purple berries. It is related to the porcelain berry that you may find around town in somebody's backyard. And it is... Uh, definitely a significant nectar source uh, for both the Memphis area and in the upper delta. It blooms and starts in June and it, it runs pretty long. Uh, it'll go right on into July because you'll have different stages of growth. You'll have your mature vines, if they don't get killed off, they'll bloom a little earlier and then your, as it spreads and grows, the new stuff will start blooming. Vitex. This is a summer blooming shrub. Um, I haven't driven around Jonesboro much. I know around Memphis, I notice more and more Vitex. It is replacing the crepe myrtles. I'm sure uh, y'all have heard about the issues that crepe myrtles have with disease now. There's problems with them. Um, Vitex is much hardier and it produces nectar and pollen. And uh, you can make a good quality honey off of Vitex. It's very light and floral. Uh, 
The most Vitex I have is on a cut flower farm in Witten, Arkansas. Uh, they, uh, it's Witten Farms. They raise flowers for bouquets, wreaths, and things of that nature. Um, she keeps vast hedgerow of Vitex. She snips these off. And one of the wonderful and interesting things about Vitex is when you snip that blossom off, you deadhead it, it will rebloom. So you can make this thing bloom all summer long. You can also get those uh, from some of the forestry departments. I'm pretty sure the Oklahoma Forestry Service sells them. Uh, Arkansas may, but they, they sell out quick. These are very popular trees. They're beautiful, they're shrubby, um, they're slightly smaller than a mature crepe myrtle. They're a little slower to grow, but you can prune them. Uh, very hardy, very drought tolerant once established. They are not native. As you can see, they are beautiful blooms. They, they make these little spikes. That's uh, why they're so popular in her bouquets. This is red vine. It's a uh, Brunicchia ovata. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, the kois and what they done with the bees in the area. They left this area because of this plant. Uh, Dicamba wreaked havoc on these red vines. Um, red vines are all along the delta. Uh, they produce massive amounts of nectar. Uh, they're a very small greenish yellow bloom. Um, they're not very impressive. They spread and they tangle up farm equipment and farmers hate it. Um, they, they'll wrap you up, they'll trip you, they just spread, they choke trees out um, so and there's they are susceptible to uh, the sprays so there a few years ago they you you would be hard-pressed to find any walking around now I feel like it's recovering I'm seeing more and more of this stuff um, they have gotten a little tighter on dicamba but uh, it's, it's doing pretty well now I think that because of regulations and, and tightening things up. Uh, it is a native, but it is invasive, so it's kind of hard to get rid of it. I wouldn't go planting this, guys, but if you can find it and be around it, it's good for, good for the bees. Cotton. Cotton is a double-edged sword for a honey producer. Cotton can produce you some... In my opinion, high quality honey. A lot of people will argue and say it's not a high quality honey, but uh, cotton honey is usually dry, it's usually water white, and it's very sweet. Uh, it's not got an amazing flavor profile, but that's why it's so high quality to me because cotton honey can improve any honey that you blend it with. It is the best thing for blending. Uh, you will lighten your honey, you will improve the flavor of it. Uh, this this kind of honey can, can save a bad crop. Cotton, when it first starts, it'll square up, and that's when the bees work it. They start working the squares. Uh, they'll secrete nectar, and the bees work those, and then as it moves in and blooms, the bees will work the blossoms, and cotton also has extra floral nectaries on the stem. So uh, once they get mature and they get rolling, the bees really put them to work. You may notice a pink blossom in this. Cotton will bloom white the first day, and then generally not long after that, it'll turn uh, this pinkish red color and fall off. Now to the left, do you see that odd little deal there? I don't know who named it, but that's a square. And um, they'll start working that stuff and getting the nectar off of it. You can kind of see in back behind there you can see that there'll be a blossom that'll poke out of that. And the bees work it. It does. Yes, there are not a whole lot of things that have extra floral nectaries. Wild cherries are one. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, honestly, I, I can't tell you another. But uh, <laughs> cotton and uh, wild cherries have extra floral nectaries. And what that is, is it's a... Um, kind of a scarred looking little orifice and it will ooze nectar and attract insects to the tree, to the plant. 
So it's a little bit different than a flower, probably more consistent. Uh, pesticides on cotton. Cotton's going to get sprayed. And I mentioned cotton is a double-edged sword. Cotton will either make you cry tears of joy or tears of sorrow. Uh, you're going to make a good crop off of it or you're going to kill your bees. And it's bad. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. If I have any recommendations for you, it's to be near cotton, not on cotton, and talk to your farmers. And if you pay attention, you're going to watch. Now, they don't spray on a schedule. I talked to you about these farmers are making a living. They don't spray to spray. They have guys that they pay that are out here checking insect thresholds. You'll see them out in the fields with their little bug nets. They're checking. And when the threshold reaches its limit, whatever that is, that is when they spray. And they're going to spray soon. They ain't going to call you. They're not going to notify you and give you a chance to do anything. They're going to have that airplane or that ground rig out there the very next morning. So it's important to protect your bees and where you place them uh, and have a good relationship with your farmer that when they do spray, if they're going to spray near your bees, they're going to use a ground rig. If they use a ground rig on these, this is, which is a tractor with arms, uh, they're probably not going to have a problem. Sir? Farmers um, do what they got to do, and a lot of these chemical companies, they don't disclose, or nor do we know things about chemicals until there is a problem. That's the way it works in the United States is, uh, here this works, we like it, here you go. And then when the problem arises from that, that's when they're like, oh no, we gotta, we gotta look into this. So uh, we don't have a good system for that. And I really can't answer that question for you. It changes a lot on what they use. Uh, most of them kill anything and everything. They are not specific targeted applications. They, if it flies or crawls, it's gonna die. Well, I can tell you that in my experience when I've had spray kill, that if I'm lucky, and which is most of the time, they don't make it out of the field. It's how toxic it is. So you'll find them dead in the rows. They drop out of the sky. Uh, it's, you know, most of the time they don't make it back to the hive. Now in the bad occasions that they do make it back to the hive, uh, it seems to kill pretty quickly and you'll just have piles of dead bees. It'll smell awful. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but I, I don't know a whole lot about the chemicals other than they kill your bees. Uh, this is the maypop. and is a beautiful summer flower and it is everywhere down my way. Uh, I'm sure y'all see a lot of this as well. Uh, it's, it's a native, uh, it's fairly resilient. The bees love it uh, and it's beautiful to take pictures of and I love to see them. And, uh, see I'm working them. It's not a significant nectar source or pollen source. Um, it's just a beautiful picture and diversity is important for your bees. They need diverse pollen. Uh, if they're on row crops alone, you're going to see them hurting in the fall because the, they need better pollen. Sunflowers. Sunflower crops uh, we got some guys down there in, in the West Memphis area, they plant fields of sunflowers. I'm sure you guys have a lot of it up here, mostly for doves. Um, I like to think that it's for me, but it's not, it's for the birds. Uh, sunflowers, I've noticed that they, they really don't do much to them. They'll, they may spray a herbicide to start off with before they drill them. And then after that, it's pretty smooth sailing. Uh, most of your oil seed types, will produce a good amount of nectar and you'll make a honey crop off of them. The, the beauty types, the varied colors and stuff, bees don't seem to like them. I don't know why, but uh, those smaller, yes ma'am. Where does it taste like? Hmm? Where does it taste like? I don't like sunflower honey. Um, I, I didn't describe it for that reason. Uh, 
A lot of people love sunflower honey. The Memphis Area Beekeeper Association maintains an apiary at the Agri Center. Uh, the Agri Center there in Memphis is known for their sunflower fields. So the main honey that the bees at the Agri Center make is sunflower honey. To me, it leaves an aftertaste that I do not like or find palatable at all. Uh, a lot of people love it. It's very popular. Uh, it does have a, it's a more earthy flavored honey. Uh, it's slightly nutty uh, and it has an earthy aftertaste that's unappealing to me. Do you, have you had smartweed honey? That's another earthy honey. Um, er, smartweed. Earthy is a, a descriptor that uh, almost like a barnyard type quality. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that as we move on. Now we're getting into this portion of it. Um, I haven't specified enough as I've went through here on the differences between the Memphis area and then in East Arkansas on that side. Um, it's primarily just the row crops. You cannot make honey off of crops in Memphis other than the sunflowers. Cotton and soybean will not produce. Now, the next major difference is this, goldenrod. Goldenrod is for the hill country. Uh, you on the ridge, uh, anybody at a slightly higher elevation, uh, you're going to have goldenrod in the late summer. It makes, um, in my opinion, a very good honey. It is well known for its odor when it's being produced. It smells like uh, old socks, sweaty socks, kind of pungent. But it mellows out. And to me, pure goldenrod, when it's not tainted by aster, uh, tastes like butterscotch. It's very good, very good honey. Bees love it and everything else loves it. This beautiful flower here is smartweed, and this grows in the lowlands. You do not get goldenrod in the lowlands and the wetlands like West Memphis. You get smartweed. Uh, areas of Memphis you, that don't grow goldenrod, you get smartweed. Uh, this tolerates wet areas. Um, I'm sure if any of you are duck hunters, you're very familiar with this smart weed. The waterfowl love it. It is related to buckwheat. It is an astounding nectar producer to uh, many beekeepers' bane. Um, most teach to have your honey supers off definitely by the second week of September because of this. Um, the reason is, is it produces a honey that smells and tastes like a wet dog. It is, um, it is strong, it is earthy, uh, and it is very pungent. It has an odor that makes you question if it has spoiled, even if it's 17% nectar. Uh, it doesn't smell fermented. It's not a fermented smell, but it is a spoiled smell. Um, and it is just extremely difficult to sell. If you get any of this in any of your other honey, it will taint it. You cannot blend this stuff, so don't try it. Many a beekeeper has tried to mix in some smart weed and it don't fly. So you're better off if you want this honey to go ahead and make it, keep it separate and let people know what it is because there are people that want it. Now, most people say, I'll give it back to the bees, let the bees have it. Problem is with this smart weed, if you don't have supers on, they will pack out that, that I run single brood chamber. If you do, then you will have this problem. If you don't have a honey super on, they will pack out that deep and they will push the lid up with comb. Um, it is that strong of a flow. You can make two supers of honey off this stuff in a good year. And it's honey you don't want, but it's, if, you, <laughs> if you don't put it in the super, then they're going to clog out that brood nest. And the problem there is that it's late in the season and they won't have nowhere to lay and you're gonna have a cluster about this big in February. Um, so it's important to, to keep her some room to lay. Uh, it is it's not a good bee feed. It's not great for the bees, it's a dark honey. Uh, it, it's not good for them over the winter. Uh, that's the primary difference. This is for the hill country, this is for the lowland. 
uh, this is a better honey that sells really well, and this one uh, you have to get real creative. Well, I personally have found a use for it in hot honey, which is an infused honey. Uh, if you can find something that is stronger than it, then, then you can use it. Uh, but there are some ethnicities and uh, uh, people from other countries that, that tend to like this, this type of honey. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it reminds them of something from their place. But uh, it's also a way I market this is uh, dark fall honey. I, I push it. Um, you know, it's got lots of antioxidants. Uh, Smartweed's also known as heart seeds. It's, uh, it's a herb. It's a medicinal herb. Most of your fall flowers, which we're going to see some more of here in a second if I'm not running out of time, are, um, are medicinal herbs. So generally, your fall honey is better for you. I guess I've rambled enough about smartweed. This is ironweed, and it's everywhere as well. Um, typically, our fall flowers that we get in this area, uh, as well as mine, they're beautiful. You'll see lots of bone set, goldenrod. Maybe some smart weed mixed in. This beautiful um, iron weed. It's, uh, they're, they're beautiful, and the bees work them. Uh, it's also a medicinal herb, um, and it contributes to your fall honey. Now look closely in here. Hopefully it'll show up on there. But there are tons and tons of bees inside this bone set, which is also a medicinal herb. And the bees, I mean, they work this stew out of it. You'll hear it humming. Bone set. It's got a it's got a smell to it um, that I can't describe to you. It's not off-putting. It's just um, a lot of these medicinal herbs I'm, I'm showing you and talking to you about in the fall. They have a, a medicinal smell. That's also a honey descriptor as well. Uh, Christy was talking about uh, honey tasting. Uh, you'll find some of these descriptors in, in these competitions, but uh, medicinal is one of them. Um, and a lot of your fall honeys, they, they have that medicinal quality to them. Some people like that. This is Coreopsis. It's everywhere. Y'all I'll see it, I'm sure. It just, it's beautiful. Bees work it a little bit. It's not extremely significant. It's just, uh, we again start to see that diversity that we have in the spring, again in the fall. Summer, not as much, but in the fall, so many wonderful things because this is such a rich area, so rich of an area. And finally, aster. Aster's everywhere. It's in the lowlands. It's in the hills. Uh, if you have a lot of it, it's going to tank your goldenrod honey and give it um, a bitter and medicinal taste that... Uh, a lot of people don't like. It's hard to get away from that around here. Uh, where I'm from in the mountains in Virginia, uh, you get a goldenrod honey that tastes like uh, Werther's Original. It's very butterscotchy. I moved down here and uh, Mr. Hodum and some others, they were telling me how much they hated goldenrod. Goldenrod's awful. You don't want that goldenrod honey. You don't want to say, I was like, people love goldenrod honey. What are you talking about? But I made a little goldenrod honey down here and it was not the same. Finally, I, I did make some in Mississippi, North Mississippi, and uh, it was very much similar, had that strong butterscotch flavor to it. Um, and if you can get it like that, and you can get people tasting it, you can mark that up quite a bit and get, get a good price for it, because it, it is special. Uh, that's the main differences in beekeeping in the Memphis area or, or over on this side. Uh, this was very plant-centered, but beekeeping is. I encourage all beekeepers to, to learn the floral sources in their area because everything that the bees do or are going to do is based off of this. Every decision they make to swarm, uh, to start build up, to stop laying, all these things are affected by these floral sources. You may notice too, even if you have high mite counts and you got a lot of mite pressure or you have disease issues, a lot of times a strong nectar flow will bring you out of that. So nectar and plants are extremely important. So I'll take questions if you have any.